Thank you, everybody. You know, I had my red pill moment also, and it was in March of 2006. I was innocently on my way back from a construction observation meeting in Lafayette, California. How many of you know where that is? Nobody. <laughs> Some of you. Great. I, I was listening to this free speech radio. Thank God for, you know, even on the left, they have some great shows on these um, Pacifica radio stations. Bonnie Faulkner, uh, Guns and Butter, incredible opportunity, incredible light bearer. But I wasn't ready for it. I was a flag-waving Reagan Republican, and I did not want to hear about a conspiracy involving 9-11. I believe the official story. Those buildings came down by fire, like we were told. I had never heard for five years, not one mention, because no one bothered to talk to me. Maybe they were afraid to talk to me, like some of you have experienced talking to your friends about these controlled demolitions. And you get so many rejections that you just kind of shut down. You cower. That's what's happened to me over time even, myself. But on this particular day, David Ray Griffin, a, a hero for the 9-11 Truth Movement, has written 10 books on this subject, was being interviewed by Bonnie. And he was on fire. He was talking about his essay about the explosive testimony Hundreds of first responders talked about explosions. Not one of them ends up in the final NIST report. I was blown away by this. I had to do something. I took it to my firm, the architecture firm I worked for. I bought them pizza. I made them come in and watch this evidence. Because if you don't watch it, you go on with your beliefs. Because your beliefs tell you what they've always told you to maintain your your equilibrium, but we have to shatter beliefs with truth, and we use evidence to do that at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, scientific forensic evidence. I showed it to the 15 architects and engineers that I worked with, and guess what? Every one of them got it, because before this, they thought I was nuts. What are you talking about? But the pizza helped get them into the, the <laughs> conference room, and then we now have and, that, and all 15 of them signed my petition, except my boss, he was Middle Eastern. Now we have more than 31 or 3,200 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. Hey, if 3,000 architects and engineers told you that your house was in danger of collapse, would you listen to them? Yeah. Or would you listen to the thousands of others who don't know anything about your house? Well, thousands and thousands of architects and engineers don't know anything about what happened on 9-11. But guess what? A grand jury's going to know because the, the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquire has submitted 57 of our exhibits to them, to the U.S. Attorney. And he's agreed in writing that he will impanel a special grand jury. And guess what they're going to see? They're going to see that a third tower came down on 9-11. Most architects and engineers know nothing about the third tower that collapsed on 9-11. Let's look at it. This is a 47-story skyscraper and easily the most, uh, the tallest building in most of our states. It wasn't hit by an airplane. And yet, um, about five hours after uh, the towers came down, it comes down. But it's standing fine here even after the towers came down. But five hours later, what happens? The East Penthouse comes down six seconds early. Interesting anomaly here. But then, look what happens. Oh my God. This is huge, and most architects and engineers know nothing about the third worst structural failure in history. And we're told by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain this to the American people. Oh, it came down due to fires normal office fires. These office fires, which are the worst office fires we have photographic or video evidence of in this building. Wait, those fires brought that building down like you saw in seven seconds? 
High-rise fires have never brought down a skyscraper in history, ever. And we have hundreds of, well, at least almost 100 examples of high-rise fires. But guess what does? Controlled demolition. This is an example of a controlled demolition. We have hundreds of examples across the country from which to draw our comparison. And what they do is they place shaped cutter charges to bring them down in that manner. Guess what? They have a set of typical features like a sudden onset of destruction. Fires don't do that near the base of the structure. Let's listen to Dan Rather. Or high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. Yeah, pretty sudden. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. He's even calling it out of his intuition, right? Well, when I saw this, my world started to turn upside down. I was ill for weeks and weeks. I had to get to the bottom of this. I can't just do nothing. We've been told that it was fires. We've been told that it was Muslim hijackers. Everybody, most all of my friends, like, and me too up until that time, knew this. And yet I'm seeing this. We're talking about cognitive dissonance. Does it come down straight down symmetrically into its own footprint? Let's look from West Street. Pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. I don't know if office fires can do that. How do you accomplish that? Right into its own footprint. Let's compare them side by side. A known controlled demolition on the right, building seven on the left. Is there any comparison? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives, especially since it looks exactly like a controlled demolition and fire, the official cause of this building's collapse, has never brought down a skyscraper ever in the history of skyscrapers. How does that happen? Well, you have to remove all 80 columns, any deviation in that pattern, and the building will begin to tip over if one or more of these columns are damaged, which is the official story. But do these fires have the precision to destroy all of that building's columns? Hey, let's look at how fast this building is coming down. Feature number four. Physicists clock this at free fall acceleration. How fast is that? Let's drop this. One, two, three. That's free fall. No resistance. That's how free fall happens. Those columns have 40,000 tons, five times stronger than they need to be to support this building for its weight. And yet they're completely giving up. It's as if eight stories of this building are removed, allowing the building to just fall at once. How does that happen? This can't be explained. That's why most architects and engineers know nothing about this building, because the American Society of Civil Engineers, the American Institute of Architects, of which I'm a member, have, have not issued one bulletin on the third worst structural failure in modern history. It's, we are uneducated about it. Buildings that fall naturally, they fall over to the path of least resistance. The columns are not all severed one from another. The concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder. Oh, are there witnesses that hear explosions? Well, not according to NIST, Sham Sunder. No evidence of explosives found. Later, they acknowledge we never looked for evidence of explosives. They say no witnesses. But we've got all kinds of witnesses, which we're going to show you tonight at Hartford University, 7.30 p.m., after we're shut down here with this incredible conference today. We just want to give you a little bit more. So we have two hours of detailed evidence, which we don't have time to give you today, and the witnesses of explosions and all the technical and forensic evidence that I can't show you today, including the study, 300 years, excuse me, three years, $300,000. University of Alaska, one of the top forensic structural engineers in the country, completing in the next month this incredible study, the finite element analysis that NIST was tasked to do by Congress, but which failed miserably, and we'll show you why tonight also. And uh, this is going to turn the architecture and engineering 
industry upside down. So we want to make sure all of you get this study when it comes out and pass it around. Because that's just the beginning. Building 7 opens people's minds. Always start with that. Then go on to the Twin Towers, because everybody knows how the Twin Towers came down, right? Jet plane impacts, jet fuel, all that. Jet fuel, oh my God. Let's look at the towers and tell me if jet fuel can do this. Is there a sudden onset of destruction? Feature number one. Let's take a look at the North Tower. It's standing there, and all of a sudden, the whole thing comes down fairly symmetrically. No jolt, no hesitation, no impacting as columns are buckling and resisting that downward load. How about the South Tower? It's standing there, and all of a sudden, it just comes down. It stops early. Anyway, come tonight, you'll see the whole thing again. Pattern explosions and flashes of light heard and seen by witnesses? Yeah, documented orally by the fire commissioner. Uh, more than 156 of them now uh, documented. Uh, but none of them appear in the official reports, NIST or FEMA reports, which came out early. We felt the ground shake. You could see the towers, and then it just came down. And then, well, so they're feeling the ground shaking, they're hearing an explosion, all this before the towers came down. That's not what we were told. All of a sudden, the ground just started shaking, felt like a train running under my feet. The next thing we know, we look up and the tower's collapsing. Let's listen to this. As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy duty explosion. The whole building just collapsed on us inside the lobby. Was that a secondary explosion? Yes, it was. That was it the. Was yeah, definitely a secondary explosion. I heard a second explosion and another rumble. An hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much lower. It just went ba boom, it was like a bomb went off. And another explosion came right from it, just everyone flying. There were numerous secondary explosions taking place in that building. It was con there were continuous explosions. No, the first, the first explosion, then there was a second explosion in the same building. Okay. There were two explosions. Okay. There. Federal agencies that were down there do believe that there was some... This goes on and on and on, and yet not one of these witnesses of explosions appear in any of the official reports. Explosions are not a part of the official story. Shook my bones shortly before the tower came down. I remember feeling the ground shaking, heard a terrible noise, and then debris just started flying everywhere. How many of you knew about this? How many of you knew that the seismic station 20 miles north picked up these explosions before the planes even hit the towers? Explosions in the basements picked up by witnesses, including Willie Rodriguez. We'll go into this in more detail tonight. Here's it was a Willie. janitor, like I said, on that day, there was an explosion on the basement, and uh, this is prior to the building, got hit by the plane, prior. and then the plane hit. I think a bomb went off in the lobby first, then a plane hit the building. The bomb hit the lobby first, and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. The whole story changed the day after 9-11, when the national news media picked this up and changed the story. Also, seismic signals before, in fact, seven seconds before the building's collapsing, we have the, the seven seconds before the debris starts hitting the ground, we have uh, these uh, seismic signals, 2.3 magnitude at the North Tower. Uh, and this occurs four seconds before the debris is even hitting the ground. Felt the ground shake. You could see the tower sway, and then it just came down. Um, let's look at the south, the North Tower on the right. Is there any similarity to a known controlled demolition on the left? Enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? And yet that hypothesis was relegated to a frequently asked question years after the final report came out. You see, you ever see professional demolition where they set charge on certain floors, you hear that pop, 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 heard that friggin' noise. That's when I saw the building coming down. How about the South Tower? Does it look anything like a known control demolition on the left? Let's try that once more. And yeah, and yet it's, it's not, that's not even considered as a possibility. 
I thought the terrorists planted explosives somewhere in the building. That's how loud it was, a crackling explosive. Oh, these videos are cutting off. I've never seen this happen. See, it's not me. Um, so floor by floor, pop, 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 like when they bring down a building, you know, in a controlled demolition. The firefighters almost universally are talking about this. But then something happened. They, 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 they shut up after that. Now, here's the North Tower. We're told that this upper block, this 15-story section, drove the rest of the building down to the ground and then destroyed itself. Well, that can't happen. This is the lightest part of a structure. You run a Volkswagen into a Mack truck, what gets crushed? The Volkswagen, the lighter part of the structure. It's called the, uh, <laughs> what is that called? Uh, um, it's a law of physics. Um, and two forces acting on each other, equal and opposite destructive force. But here you see what's happening. The Volkswagen is getting just crushed. That's what's going on in the first four seconds. The upper part of this building is being destroyed. But what's destroying it? We're going to be taking a look, and tonight we'll get into it a whole lot more. But we have a gravitational collapse is what we're told, but none of the photos, none of the videos show the upper part of the structure destroying the lower part. You saw it was already destroyed. What happens after that? Incredible, freely flying structural steel sections and trailed by thick white smoke clouds, which we're going to be going into more detail tonight, too. Uh, do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse? This building's 200 feet wide, but the debris is spread out symmetrically over a 1,400 foot area. Let's take a look at the South Tower. It's a symmetrical collapse. Wait, we have asymmetrical damage from the airplanes, asymmetrical damage from the fires, asymmetrical lo uh, loading on this building because the building's actually beginning to tip over, and yet complete symmetry all the way down the building. Take a look from Oh, look from below tonight. It'll blow you away. A complete symmetry, series of hundreds of explosions. The, the debris goes way past uh, 600 feet, destroying the winter gardens in the World Financial Center. The steel is completely broken up. It's shattered. And the debris is well outside the footprint of the World Trade Center site. It's a very explosive demolition in the case of the Twin Towers. Compare that to the nice, neat pile we have of Building 7, a more classic implosion. These are very different events. Do we have ejections at the lower floors? Well, 20, 40, 60 stories down below this gravitational collapse, we have all these explosive ejections, uh, and, and they're hurling pulverized building materials out of the building. These are clearly explosives, explosive speeds, 160 to 200 feet per second. So how fast is this building coming down? Well, we can clock it. In fact, physicists have done this too. It's near free fall. It's two thirds of free fall. It's accelerating straight down, almost at free fall. What does, it's getting faster and faster and faster, straight down through what? 90,000 tons of structural steel, three to five times stronger than it ever needed to be to support this building. What happened to that steel? Well, it's been totally shattered, feature number six of a controlled demolition. The NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, says look for high order damage, the shattering of the structure. Well, the structure's completely shattered, as you see. One beam from another column and all the way down to the bottom. It's completely shattered, broken up, ready for loading and shipment, one of the features of controlled demolition. But before that, it's laterally ejected. Take a look as we time lapse through here. These individual freely flying sections landing three to 600 feet in every direction, including this one. Whoa, back to, forward to, that's 45 degrees. Where does, how does gravity work? Down. What's going on here? Laterally ejected, explosively propelled, four ton to eight ton structural steel sections trailed by thick white smoke clouds. Is structural steel flammable? Not really, no. Why are the ends of these beams 
He's trailing thick white smoke clouds. We're going to go into that in more detail tonight. There's enough energy here to hurl a 200-pound cannonball three miles. Where's that energy coming from? And what happened to the floors? Each floor, an acre in size. 90,000 tons of concrete all together. No floors stacked up to the bottom on the left. On the right, we have, in Mexico, a, a typical pancaking collapse. We got pancakes at the bottom. Where are the floors? Not one of the 110 floors here. Well, what happened to it? Let's take a look, because we're missing all this concrete at the bottom. Oh, it's being pulverized in midair by what can only be explosives. 90,000 tons of concrete pulverized to a fine powder, 100 microns. 30% of the dust throughout lower Manhattan full of this concrete. Why am I telling you all this? This is extremely important for you to understand and be armed with. I'm, I'm giving you ammunition for your quivers. When you talk to people like, like your friends who aren't believing, tell them 3,000 architects and engineers demand a new investigation. Show them the scientific forensic evidence in the brochures that we have available for you uh, at our table, uh, right on the other side of this wall. Bring them, if you can, tonight at 7.30 at the University of Hartford, and they'll learn that we have 100 structural engineers demanding a new investigation, wondering why 80,000 tons of supporting structural steel failed to even stop it, wondering why near freefall collapse violates laws of physics, as stated by David Scott. Um, they, they, you could, they can know that all 110 stories would drop to the ground in 10 seconds uh, as if uh, this is in a heat-induced gravitational collapse. Not going to happen. Scott Granger, fire protection engineer, all three collapses, very uniform in nature. But natural collapses due to unplanned events are not uniform. Edward Muniak, fire protection engineer, fires were weak. Uh, these bear no resemblance to any high-rise fire collapse, as if we've ever had a high-rise fire collapse. But this is the most interesting information of all, and the most damning to the official story, the extreme and persistent heat picked up by numerous sources, numerous agencies, not conspiracy theorists. On the top of the pile, we have temperatures exceeding the hottest office fires, but there's no office fires. There's no fires on the top of the pile. What are they measuring? Much, much hotter. Molten iron, molten steel down deep in the pile that's cooling off as it gets to the surface. Liquid molten iron pulled up, dripping out of the crab claw excavators. Now, how does that happen? Because guess what? Office fires and jet fuel don't do this. We're talking 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit for this kind of temperatures. Do you see how, how many of you uh, are mildly impressed or reasonably impressed or extremely impressed with the veracity of this forensic scientific evidence? Use it. Don't sit on this information. This is what you need to be giving to those people who don't believe you because this can be their red pill moment which they've been waiting for you to give them. And if you withhold this from your friends, colleagues, and family, you are not doing them a service. You're doing them a disservice and yourself and your conscience. All of us are called to do something. So you came today to get armed with the various speakers that we have available to you. And I'm giving you perhaps the most sharpest arrow in your quiver, the scientific forensic evidence. So use it. Red hot steel pulled from deep in the pile, dripping from the molten. None of this is in the official reports. It's been completely pulled out and, and covered up, uncovering red hot metal beams, molten metal, molten metal at the heart of the tower's remains. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, it was like lava. lava from a volcano. Lava from a volcano? Guess what? Not in the official reports. Streams of molten metal. Molten metal dripping from a beam. It goes on and on and on 
and on, including from Leslie Robertson, the World Trade Center structural engineer himself, a witness to a river of molten steel flowing, like you see pouring out of the South Tower minutes prior to its collapse. This is not lead, this is not aluminum, this is steel or iron. The color of this material tells us its temperature. Molten lead and molten aluminum don't glow bright yellow in daylight conditions. And yet this tells us, oh, that's what that was. It just melted airplane. Please go back to sleep. Partially evaporated beams. That takes 2,800 degrees minimum to melt steel. This is documented by the author of the FEMA report himself, but didn't get into the FEMA report. One of the structural engineers assigned to the Fresh Kills landfill with a National Science Foundation, Abelhaz and Astani Azel, documents melting of girders. The, thinks it happened somehow down in the pile, not concerned about it, and yet FEMA did, in their Appendix C, document hot sulfur corrosion attack on the steel. Never before observed eutectic reactions, which is incredible. It doesn't happen in office fires. This is when sulfur lowers the melting point of steel. Sulfur? Solid steel girder turning into Swiss cheese like you see here in this piece of World Trade Center 7 steel. It's actually very well documented. Most of the material we're talking about here is all documented by official sources. All we did is put it together, and we're trying to get it to every architect, every engineer, every media professional, every uh, elected representative that we can possibly get to. Rapid oxidation, sulfidation, intergranular melting, liquid iron, that's molten iron, that's 2,800 degrees. Office fires, five or 600 degrees, maybe 1,000 degrees. Nothing in the official story can account for these temperatures. Not jet fuel, it's just a hydrocarbon. It only burns at five or 600 degrees. This information was omitted from the NIST report, and yet it was called by the New York Times the deepest mystery uncovered in the investigation. Thin to almost razor sharpness, this steel is just completely eroded, destroyed by this hot temperature corrosion attack. And so we have jet fuel only burning 600 degrees, one quarter of the temperature documented by so many agencies. So what can cause these temperatures? Let's look at thermite as a possibility. What is thermite anyway? An incendiary used by the military Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. So only thermite, thermate can answer the molten iron, the extreme temperatures, the presence of sulfur, which NIST says, oh, that must have come from the gypsum board. Gypsum board has never turned around and attacked the steel that it has been designed to protect for 100 years. Absolutely ludicrous, the explanations we're getting from the official story. So the NFPA was not followed because NIST says, oh, uh, we didn't find any evidence that explosives were used, but they acknowledge in writing that they never looked for it. You can't find what you're not looking for, but so many others did, uh, because what happened with the U.S. Geological Survey in their toxicological studies, the particle atlas, what do they find in all the World Trade Center dust? They find billions of these, previously molten, iron microspheres, not steel, iron. We haven't used iron in 100 years to for, for our skyscrapers. Where does this come from? There's billions and billions of them. In fact, it's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has these unexplained molten iron microspheres. R.J. Lee, another environmental consulting firm, says they're formed during 
the event, not after down in the pile where covered by dust without oxygen, it's somehow getting hotter and hotter and hotter till they got 3,000 degrees. No, these are formed during the event. They have no explanation for it. And yet 6% of the dust is composed of these previously molten iron microspheres. Here's how thermite works in just a small experiment here, slowing it down halfway. We have lots of what look like sparks, but they're molten iron microspheres. That's how thermite works. That's what explains what's in the dust. And what else was in the dust? A small team of scientists find chips of red-gray, dual-layered. They look like paint, but they're not paint. They put them in a heater, and they ignite, producing a lot more energy. It's fascinating. They get real curious. They zoom in. They find the ingredients of thermite in paint chips. They get real curious, of course, zoom in with an electron microscope, find nanoparticles of iron oxide and aluminum powder. This is called super thermite. It's been developed prior to 9-11 by Lawrence Livermore Lab, etc. It's set in an organic bed of oxygen, silica, carbon. This is the matrix, which is organic. The organic material is what makes TNT so explosive. So, they, and, and when, they, when they heat it up, it produces what? Previously, uh, there were molten iron microspheres. So we know where those old molten iron microspheres came from. They came from those red-gray chips of super thermite. As if we didn't know, they're found attached to partially ignited red-gray chips. So you see, this is an internally consistent, self-corroborating set of experimental repeatable data that can be used to bring a whole lot of perpetrators to jail and in prison for the rest of their life, if we're not worse, for treason. That's what's going on here. That's what the special grand jury is going to be looking at, this forensic evidence. Do you think their jaws are going to drop? I think so. This is a very sophisticated process, not made in a cave in Afghanistan. This is made only in the most advanced defense contracting laboratories. 24-page peer-reviewed paper available online for you to give your congressman. And tell them about the destruction of evidence, the illegal destruction of evidence in a crime scene two weeks after 9-11 starting. All this went to China for recycling before investigators could get their hand on it. It's crucial evidence that can answer many questions, according to Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering Magazine. So what we've shown today already in just half an hour is a glimpse of the power of this scientific forensic evidence. This is not, fire doesn't create any of these features, let alone all of them. So this is proof. And that's why we want you to go to your congressman. The Bobby McElveen Act is draft legislation. We need one congressperson to submit this for an, an in your congressperson, uh, for an in, independent investigation of this evidence. The Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth will be joining me tonight at the University of Hartford. Come and get the address from uh, our flyer at our table so you can join us at 7.30 there. Mick Harrison, Dave Meiswinkle will be there all together with me. We're going more in depth than the scientific forensic evidence. We're going more in depth than the legal strategies that we're employing, such as working with the U.S. attorney and hopefully overcoming his resistance. Uh, and our lawsuit of the FBI, too, by the way, uh, which we'll tell you about tonight in a lot more detail. We have an ironclad case. It's about to bust wide open. So uh, we also have some DVDs left. We've sold an awful lot of them through donations to, to support our, uh, our educational charity that we, we provide. We have to support ourselves. And so come and visit our table and arm yourself with this evidence with the DVDs that we have at our site. And do something. I chose to do something. Uh, there wasn't one architect and engineer organizing anything five years after 9-11. And all I did is say, my god, I can't stand here and do nothing. I got to do something. So I put it together. As I mentioned, you can do the same. Thank you so much. Nailed it. Nailed it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, stand up Thank for you that. So much.